Thank you. You may be seated. Well, for those who just came in about five or ten minutes ago, this has been quite a morning. Okay, show up at about 8.30 and the power went out, whole, the whole church here. Rocky the raccoon over here got into a power line and we had no power. So we transitioned outside. We had a lovely, now the Lord knew this was going to happen and he provided November 8th. It's 72 degrees out today, huh? Who would, who would have predicted? Last week it was snowing, wasn't it? So anyways, the next week it could be snowing, but we'll take it for what it is. So we set up outside, and now power came back, so we're back in here. So we are so thankful to be here, to be able to worship together. I know I've been running around like crazy, so it's just, I, this week has been kind of uh, anxious on a, a lot of anxiety, different things going on, so I hope you can just set those aside and just Prepare your hearts for worship uh, this morning. I'm excited we're going to be going through one of Jesus' most familiar parables in Luke chapter 6. Reminds us with all the craziness going on, all right, who's your foundation? Okay, we need to be reminded of that, and that is in uh, Jesus Christ. So I'm glad to be able to share with you from the Word this morning from Luke chapter 6. We're going to be having communion uh, together, so we're going to enjoy that at the Lord's uh, table few announcements here. Uh, next week, you do not want to miss out. It's our annual Missionary Christmas, and we are just so blessed as a church to be able to have uh, missionaries that are going to be joining us. We have uh, Daryl and uh, Jill Powell. They're serving with World Venture. They will be here. And for our Sunday school hour, normally we have all different Sunday school classes. We're going to have one combined Sunday school class. Um, it will be in the Carlson uh, there and we're going to just be able to hear a little bit about their ministry. And then also, uh, Daryl's going to be uh, bringing the word for us uh, next week. Um, so when we'll have a love offering for the missionaries and all that they do, a uh, Christmas offering. Yes, we will be singing some Christmas carols. My, my uh, neighbor across the street actually putting up their Christmas lights. Has anybody done that yet? I, uh, it's just like, we've got to celebrate Thanksgiving, and then after that comes Christmas seems like the day after Halloween, people are anxious to get the Christmas lights up. It's too early. Mm -hmm. But we will be singing some Christmas carols next week. So come out and uh, join us for our annual missionary uh, Christmas. Other than that, everything is uh, pretty much uh, normal. So we invite you to come to Wednesday nights if, uh, for our RBC Kids and Friendship and our Youth uh, Ministries. Those are all going on uh, this week. Um, but any other uh, just questions, look in your er, bulletin of other things going on. Enough of that. I'm going to pray and uh, dedicate this service to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful in this uh, year 2020 of uh, just being uh, needing to adapt. And uh, we know that you have a plan. Nothing surprises you. You are still on the throne. You are a ruler of all, and we are, are thankful for that. I just pray that we would just put our faith, our trust, and our foundation in you, Father, and not other things that this uh, world has to offer. So I pray that you would just uh, be with our service, that we would just uh, lift our voices to you and our song, 
and that we also would just learn from your word. You would change our hearts and that we would just be able to uh, live out the gospel and show a, a world that desperately needs uh, their foundation to be in Jesus Christ. So as we look at how we can live out our faith this morning, I pray that you would just challenge us. We pray these things in your name. Amen. song King of Kings. We'll stand it as we sing the last couple before the message. In the darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your horizon the law and prophets in your virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a greater in the earth.
build a kingdom come and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side, knowing this was our salvation, Jesus for his lady to die. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. And the more that you rose, all of heaven held its breath, so that stone was good for good, for the land that conquered the death, and the dead rose from their tomb, and the angels stood in awe, and the souls of all who come to the Father of restored. From the spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. In his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. From the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise the Even 
what the enemy means for evil. You turn it for our good. You turn it for our good and for your glory. Even in the valley, you are faithful. You're working for our good. You're working for our good and for your glory. Even what the enemy means for evil. You turn it for our good. You turn it for our good and for your glory. Even in the valley, you are faithful. You're working for our good. You're working for our good and for your glory. Your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. Your faithful forever. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas of blood and fills the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that overtakes the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command, and all the stars obey. I sing the Let us pray together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that we can gather together and to worship. Thank you, Lord, how you've made provisions for this church throughout this past year. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. We pray today for those that have special needs. We just pray for those that have lost loved ones this past week or so. We just pray that you just give them comfort and peace during this time. And we pray for those that <coughs> are in the hospital or those that are... Uh, suffering illnesses at this time. We just pray, too, that you just be with Pat with his uh, broken rib, that it will heal quickly, and pray that he'll be back soon with us. Pray for their son, Jeff, as well, with his back surgery, that he'll have healing. We pray for others, Lord, that you know their needs. We just pray today that you'll just uh, provide for them in a special way. We ask, Lord, that you'll just bless this worship time today. We pray for Pastor Justin as he brings forth the word today. It will speak to each one of us and give us the information we need to be a testimony and a light for you here in the Rockford community, Lord. We pray that we just be open to those around about us. We know there's lots of anxiety and different stress situations going on these days with all that's been going on. We pray that we would be there to be a support for them and to be uh, a pillar for you, Lord, as we uh, uh, work here on this earth as you have asked us to do. We thank you, Lord, for all of our staff and for each one that work so faithfully here at the church to provide for all our ministries. We thank you for all that have um, went forward to work on our new boards as we've just had our annual meeting. We thank you for the good reports and for all that's went on this past year. Even though we've went through this difficult time, you have blessed our church and we're so thankful for that. We're thankful that, that Pastor Jake has been able to uh, keep 
us uh, going with technology and also for our youth we ask that you just bless them Lord because it's been a difficult year for them as well without having many of the opportunities they've had to uh, go on retreats and different things we ask Lord that you just join them together in unity and help them to get through this time and Lord we pray that 2021 will be a good year of uh, worshiping you and to uh, enjoying fellowship and be back to our norm, Lord, we pray that you'll just uh, go before us. We pray now that you'll just bless our time here. We pray that you will uh, continue to bless our church through our offerings that you have provided. Thank you for the gifts that you have uh, given us this past year. We look forward to this coming year. And as we think about this month of November and the Thanksgiving time, we are so thankful for all that you've done for us, for providing your son to us for salvation. And we just thank you for that. And we look forward to the day of your return. We look forward to the day of seeing you in heaven. Pray and give you thanks this day in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. John was confused. He was confused by the doubts that he was having in his mind. Why should John be having such doubts? After all, John had led a growing religious study group at the university where he received his degree. While leading that group, John had initiated a nonprofit organization which brought charitable relief to uh, the poor in his town. Then John had actually become an, an ordained minister. He had been ordained minister for the past 10 years John had even gone on some missions trips, overseas missions trips, in which he had preached the gospel and had witnessed people responding to his invitations. But it was on his way back from one of these missions trips, as he was traveling across the ocean by ship, that John had become friends with some humble Christian brothers. Their simple faith and walk with the Lord had challenged John. He knew that he didn't have the relationship with the Lord that they did. John could tell you all the facts of the gospel. He actually preached them. But something was missing in his life, and he knew it. So after several weeks of inner struggle and turmoil, John sought out one of the friends that he had made and asked him question after question about his faith. And little by little... This humble, anonymous Christian brother explained to John the essence of Christianity. That it was ultimately a relationship that a person has with God through faith in the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Even though John had led a college Bible study in 1726 and been an ordained pastor in 1728, and had taken missions trips to give the gospel to the Indians from 1735 to 1737, it was on May 24th, 1738, that John Wesley asked Jesus Christ to be his personal Lord and Savior, beginning a personal relationship with God. See, before that time, he had been a very religious person, but he had not been born again into the family of God. Now, some of us maybe can relate. You may have grown up being relig religious, but not having that personal relationship, growing relationship with God. That's what we're going to be looking at this morning in Luke chapter 6. This is one of Jesus' most recognizable parables. It's about two people who built identical houses close to each other, but on two different foundations. One whom Jesus calls foolish because his house was on the sandy shore. The other pulled it back a few dozen yards so he could build it on a solid foundation, which is a rock. Now, I want us to look at this story in context because Jesus tells it with both a warning and also a promise. So let's read these words together in Luke chapter 6, starting with verse 43 here through 49. No good tree bears bad fruits, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his hearts. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. 
For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and doesn't put them and puts them into practice. He's like a man who building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck the house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Now, when looking at our Bibles and digging in, the context is always king. And in this parable, Jesus is warning us against something. So what exactly is it? Well, if you read back in the chapter, you'll see that he's talking to a bunch of religious people and he's warning them that a lot of people think you're right with God, but they are wrong. It's important to note here that Jesus is not talking about people who are flagrantly hypocritical, like people who live double lives or people who fake church on the weekends while sleeping around and doing other things like cheating on their taxes and doing drugs and all that. He's not talking about them. He's talking about sincere religious people who are self-deceived. People who assume they're good with God, but they're not. And Paul here gives us three characteristics of these self-deceived people. Verse 33 says, what is a characteristic? The first one is they don't bear spiritual fruit. They may say all the right things. They may be in all the right places. But when you look closely at their lives, the fruits of an encounter with Jesus, they're just not there. I might ask, what exactly am I talking about? What are these fruits? Well, evidences of a new birth. I mean, did you see the excitement last week of Sandy Devereaux? I mean, she was just so excited to be baptized. And people in her life group that night said that whole day, she was just so excited. There's evidence of a new birth. There's a change in her life that is just incredible. So that's something of bearing fruit, uh, growing to love Jesus, to have a desire to know him to be with his people, to love his people, a growing dislike of sin and an attraction to Christ-likeness. These things we know, they just don't all happen at once, but someone who is really right with God will see evidences of them growing in their relationship with him. Just like when you check, check someone's pulse and breath to see if they are physically alive, these things show whether or not you are spiritually alive. One of my favorite analogies for this when I heard when I was in college was just say there's a a terrible storm. There's a bad storm, and you come across a power line that's been knocked down by a tree. And this wasn't one of these little tiny wires. This is one of the big wires from high above. Let's say it's coming out of a transformer. And you say, I wonder if this is a live wire, right? And you go and you, you pick it up. Your friends are there. You go pick it up and you say, oh, man, I feel that. Oh, that's a strong current. I can feel that going through my body. And then you put the wire down and you just keep on walking. What would you say to that person? I'd say there's no way you could pick up a live wire and not be changed by that wire in a dramatic way, right? What would happen? You'd be fried. Yes, your hair would be sticking straight up. You'd be flat on your back. You would be fried. So here's a question we need to ask ourselves. Does your life show any evidence of Christ's work in you? Are you growing in your love for Jesus? Are you passionate to see others come to know him? Do you find the commandments of Christ just burdensome? Like, oh man, or are you attracted to them? Are you one of those people who are like, oh, you know, there's all this stuff in the world that I really love. And I really want to be there in the world, but I'm a Christian. I got all these rules I got to follow. Oh, man, woe is me, <laughs> right? Maybe you're here at church, but, but are you here for the right reason? Are you here because you, you love the people of God, because you love his word, because you want to grow closer to him? Or are you here because somehow you think, well, if I show up to church on Sunday, maybe God will love me a little more for doing this for him or Maybe to make mom and dad happy. I don't know what the reasons are, but why are you here at church this morning? 
Does your heart show evidence of spiritual life? Jesus is saying the question is not whether or not you want to go to heaven or hell. It's whether or not God has worked in you, your heart so you want to get to know God. I mean, let's be honest. Everybody wants to go to heaven, don't they? Everybody does. The question is whether or not you want to meet God when you get there. A desire for God, not a desire for heaven, is the evidence of God's work in your life. If I were to ask you whether you are a Christian, don't tell me about a prayer that you prayed back in the day. Tell me about the evidence of how God has been working in your life. Share testimonies about how God has been working in your life. You think about it, if your friends who know you away from church don't see plainly you're born again or see anything different about your life from other non-Christians, you have to ask yourself, am I really born again? So that's the first characteristic of someone who is self-deceived, and that is they don't bear any spiritual fruit. The second characteristic is found in verse 46. They don't do what Jesus says. It says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? They've turned to Jesus as a get out of hell, a free card, right? Or, or maybe I'm, I'm dealing with these physical issues, and, and Jesus, I, I need your help, I need you to heal me. But they are not fully surrendered to what Jesus says. It's not sufficient just to give lip service to Christ's lordship. Genuine faith produces obedience. I mean, we can have an academic relationship with Jesus. I mean, Jesus spoke many times of how religious leaders, they knew the word, even Satan and, and the devil. You know, he knows the word, but they're not actually shaping their lives in obeying the word. Or for many of us, unfortunately, our relationship with Jesus may be that of just being a fan, someone who likes to be associated with Jesus. You get the t-shirt, right? Jesus is my homeboy. I love Jesus, right? But really, you're not personally shaped by him. Jesus knew there were many who were going to be his fans. And what happened? A lot of times, you'd get a lot of followers of Jesus, and then what would he do? He'd give a really tough teaching, and then what would happen to everybody? They'd disappear, right? But to know him as Lord means to give him full authority to serve, to submit to him. So whether it's surrendering our finances to him or our career and dreams, or maybe it's some command that you say, Jesus, I just can't obey this. I know your word said this, but I just can't obey it. I know maybe you asked me to forgive, right, Lord? But there's this person that I just can't do it. I can't do it. But if you call Jesus Lord of your life, you must surrender to him. As my dad always said, Christ is either Lord of all or not Lord at all. And then we have a third characteristic, and that's found in verse 49. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like the man who built a house on ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. So these people, their faith falls apart when they go through the storms. So basically, the storm reveals that their faith wasn't real. The story of the two houses shows you that the two lives look alike. If you were just looking at them from a distance, you'd say these were exactly the same. But it was what was below the surface that was different, and the storm revealed that. There are people who walk with Jesus, and everything's great until life gets hard until maybe God doesn't answer some prayer the way you want, or until it may be unpopular with your friends, or until some, some obedience to, you know, to Jesus means walking away from something that you really, really want. For many people, their hope is not in God. It's in what he can do for them. And that's revealed in our storms. These people fall away from God because their hope is not in God, it's in God's ability to keep them in sunny weather all the time, right? So remember these two houses Jesus is talking about. They look the same on the outside. The difference is what they do with what they believe. And verse 47 says, Jesus says, The one with the solid foundation is the one who hears my words and who puts them into practice. 
And this is a major theme in Jesus' teachings. Not everyone who calls Jesus Lord is going to heaven. Now, if you flip over to the book of Matthew, it gives the same account of Jesus' teaching where he tells the story of two trees and the wise foolish man, and he includes this one other illustration. If you look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 and 22. Listen to verse 21, Matthew chapter 7 here. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So I want you to underline two words here. These two words in this passage are says and does. What do these people say? They say, Lord, Lord. These people believe in God. They acknowledge him to be Lord with their lips. It says they also prophesied in his name. In other words, they claim to speak on God's behalf. A prophet was a person who claimed to receive a message from God, claiming to be a spokesperson for God. And not only did they acknowledge God and claim to speak on his behalf, it says they also performed miraculous works. They cast out demons in Jesus' name. I don't know what kind of church you grew up in, but in a church, if you got picked to be on the demon exorcism squad, like that's varsity, okay? That's not freshman JV. That's varsity level here. But Jesus tells them, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. See what he's getting at here? He says they confess Jesus, but Jesus did not confess them. So we ask why? Because they never fully yielded their lives to Jesus. And Jesus says to them, you knew me, but I didn't know you. <laughs> the kind of knowledge that comes from surrendering your life to me, putting all your hope in me as a Savior, and having a personal relationship with me. For some of us this morning, this is pretty uncomfortable, right? Because the statement says that not everyone who calls Jesus Lord actually belongs to him. You say, well, you know, how about other passages in Scripture I thought we are saved by faith alone, by believing Christ as our Savior, by trusting in His work alone to save us. And we are. We absolutely are. But the kind of faith that saves is faith that reorients your whole entire life. It puts the roots of your life into the gospel soil. It builds the foundation of your life on gospel truth. You see, there's two ways to tell what you really believe. There's what your mouth says you believe, and there's what your life says you believe. Which one do you think is more reliable? God looks at your life as a better indicator of what you believe than your mouth. So the question is, does your life say that Jesus is Lord? So as we looked at three characteristics of people who are basically spiritual imposters, they don't bear spiritual fruit, they don't do what Jesus says, their faith falls apart when they go through storms. We have to ask ourselves today, is this true of any of us today? And if these are true of us, you have to ask yourself, what can I do? Well, I have great news for you this morning. Look at verse 21 of Matthew 7 again. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of of my Father who is in heaven. Now that raises a big question, doesn't it? What is the will of the Father who is in heaven? Well, there are many answers that could be given to this question, but there is one basic answer that is foundation for all of the others. And that is summarized, I think, the most clearly in John 6, verses 39 through 40. It says these words, And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. 
You see, God the Father sent his one and only Son into this world to provide an atonement for our sins. God knew that this was the only way the spirit, to have spiritual fellowship with him, the only way that he could restore our relationship with the, the human race and a sinless God. No amount of religion could restore fellowship with God. The only way that fellowship with God could be restored was for God to take care of that sin question once and for all. And he did this by sending his one and only son into this world to be a final sacrifice for our sins. Now God's will is for everyone who embraces Jesus Christ and realizes there is nothing that you can do to save yourself. He's the only one who can save us. He paid our full sin debt on the cross and offers to give you that and come into your life and make you a totally new creation. And Jesus said, those who do the will of the Father will enter the kingdom of God. So that's the beautiful, wonderful news of the gospel. And that's what we're about, isn't it? Preacher was once walking down the street with a manager of a local soap factory who was not a believer. And the manager was just berating the failures of Christianity down through the centuries. He said, here the church had been in existence for almost 2,000 years, and still there was crime, corruption, so much misery in the world. After 2,000 years of sermons about goodness and truth and prayers for peace, look at the world. How could the preacher claim that Christianity was God's truth? The preacher actually wasn't saying much as they walked along, but then they came to this playground. There were some young children playing over in this sandbox, and they had gotten some water, and they were making some, some sand castles together, and the sand and the dirt was all over them. And the preacher stopped and pointed to the children. Look at those children over there, he said. Here you are, a manager of a soap factory, and you claim that your soap can wash dirt off of people, and look at all of the bars of soap you have pumped out into the world, but look at these children over there. They're filthy with dirt. What good is your soap? I wonder about the quality of the soap that you produce in your factory. But that's not a fair argument at all, the soap maker answered. You can't expect our soap to work unless somebody actually uses it. Exactly true, replied the preacher. The shed blood of Jesus Christ only washed the sins away of people who personally trust and believe in him. And you know the encouragement that we have this morning? And those who hear Jesus' words, those who put them into practice, will endure whatever storms come into your life. Because Christ is their foundation. You look back at 2020, it's been such a roller coaster, isn't it? I don't know how people can get through it without having Jesus Christ as their firm foundations. All of their foundations, even good ones, apart from Christ, they're going to eventually crumble. So, what's your foundation? Is it a great, reliable job? Is it a solid bank account? Is it having the right party in office? If it's not Jesus, eventually that foundation is going to crumble. But when it's Jesus, in any storm that you go through, you can stand secure because you know he has the power over that storm and can preserve and provide for you even while going through that storm. I saw this picture uh, a couple of years ago, and this was of a house um, off the Gulf Coast of uh, Florida, and this was um, during the, uh, the, one of the worst hurricanes that hit, Hurricane Harvey. This was one of the worst hurricanes to make landfall, actually, in U.S. history. And you notice all the neighbors on the sides there got wiped out clean, but this one house is standing tall. It's standing strong, isn't it? And they had to get a hold of this builder. And they found him and they interviewed him. And he said, yeah, I built this house with that storm in mind. He went way above code. He used 40-foot pilings. He made the house with breakaway walls so that the winds wouldn't tear them down. There were, they would stand the structural damage, right, of this storm. So think about that statement. I built this house with that storm in mind. You know, God provided a salvation in Jesus Christ with all of life's storms in mind. 
And as we just, I want to ask the men to come forward at this time. As we just think of what Jesus Christ has done for us, we think of the foundation that we have of, of what we can, you know, our solid foundation of Him. And as we go through life storms, we know as we get tossed and turned, we have the foundation of Jesus Christ. And I just couldn't help but think of a great, great hymn, one of my favorites, How Firm a Foundation, You Saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you what he has said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. So let's just close our eyes this morning. I just want us to prepare our hearts to partake of uh, communion this morning. And I just want us to, to think of this question. Has God been shaking you over the last six months? Has he revealed different areas of disobedience in your life? I know we would all say, yes, I, I go to church. I consider myself a religious person. But have we given everything to Jesus God consistently reveals to us areas that we are not surrendered to him. What does he do? He causes them to fall apart, to crumble. But when we surrender everything to Jesus, no matter what storm we may be going through, we can say, no matter what, Jesus, I believe you have this. It's been a crazy year, but I believe, Jesus, that you have this. I'm doing what you want me to do, I'm living by faith, not by sights, and I'm giving this area to you. I may be fearful. I may be so many things going on, but I'm giving this area to you because I trust you, Father. You are my foundation. So do you have areas you need to put under Jesus' control this morning? I just pray that as we partake of, of the cup and, and the bread, that we would just lay these areas at the cross today. And that we would be able to reflect on the goodness, on the mercy, on the grace of you, Jesus, and what you provided for us on the cross. We know that we have a firm foundation. We have a glorious future to look forward to. But I pray that you would just help us as, as we daily struggle with our sinful nature to lay everything at your feet, to realize our foundation is in you. It's not in other things and that we would trust in you, and that you would help us just to live out the gospel in our lives. So I just pray that we would just reflect on these words uh, this morning, and I would just like to ask our brother Dale to just pray for the bread that represents the body of Christ. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for your great love and your great mercy to us, Lord, that even though that we fail you many times that you don't fail us. And we just thank you for sending your son here to earth to give up his body and to rise again for our salvation, Lord. We just pray, Lord, that we will just continue to remember your words, continue to remember these words of the sermon, Lord, that, that we need to really show our love for you and obey in your words. In Jesus' name, amen.
Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I'd like to ask Brent to pray for the cup, which represents the blood that was shed on the cross. Heavenly Father, as we partake of this cup in remembrance of the blood that was shed for our sins, we thank you for the wonderful gift of your salvation. As we reflect on these moments, may you remind us, continuously remind us the love that you have for us. And may you inspire us to live a holy and acceptable lives, which is our reasonable service. In Jesus' name, amen. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant of my blood. Do this as often you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, we come before you now, and we are so thankful for your sacrifice on the cross. And we just pray through your Spirit's power that we would be able to live out the life that you would want us to, that we would be fully obedient to you. Thankful for the cross. Thank you for sin that has been forgiven. Thank you for the glorious future we have to look forward to. But I pray that you would just empower us. We don't want to live religious lives. We want to live totally changed lives. The new birth that has, has come upon us and that that would just be able to be seen by our friends at work, our friends in our community, our neighbors, that we are changed and that we want to obey you and live out the gospel, Father. So I pray you'll just help us this week. We pray these things in your name. Amen. We're going to stand and close with a great song, He Reigns. And that's a great hymn for us this coming week. It's 
all God's children singing glory, glory. Hallelujah, he reigns. He reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory. Hallelujah, he reigns. He reigns. And all the powers of darkness tremble at what they just It's all got children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns. It's all got children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns. It's all got children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns. It's all got children singing glory, glory. All right, if you'd be seated for a minute, we have a little bit of business to do this morning, besides everything else we've been doing today. But anyway, uh, Brett and I are here to uh, present to the church today for membership, and uh, the elders are recommending that we accept the uh, following names into our membership. Uh, Jim and Sandy Devereaux, I don't see them here today, but uh, we just seen them last week, uh, Sandy's baptism. Um, Dave Cook, Jr., if you guys had come forward, that'd be great, so everybody knows. Uh, Julie Wilson and uh, Scott and Robin Duche. You'd come forward. So the elders will make a recommendation to accept these individuals into our membership. Do I have a second? All right. All right, we got lots of seconds today. We're all glad you're coming aboard. <laughs> um, all in favor, let's uh, vote. Um, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Uh, votes carried, and we will uh, add these individuals into our membership, and uh, we're thankful for that. Uh, if you want to give them a hand, that's great, because we're not going to be able to give them a right hand to fellowship today. So we won't be able to give a right hand of fellowship today, but you just gave them a welcome, so we're glad for that. And we will ask them to go to the back of the church. At least you can say hi and uh, welcome to RBC. And we're thankful for your going through the membership and joining our church. So you would you dismiss to go to the back. Okay? And Pastor Justin will right. now close the service in prayer. Thank you, Dan. We're going to finish here with just words from Ephesians chapter 3. It says, May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's our prayer this week. You are dismissed.
And long of children singing glory. 